Hi, welcome to the International Quiz Choice Online News. I'm Robin Steinberg, and today we have a very special guest with me. She's none other than uh, Miss Rita Springer, and she's a great worship leader as well as artist and composer. And she also founded uh, this wonderful organization called uh, Finding Eve Conferences. And there's more to her, actually, and we're going to ask her more about it soon. Now, her book, Finding Eve, is now available at all good leading bookstores all, all around the world, as well as Amazon.com, Barnes & Nobles, as well as at the nearest bookstore near you. If they don't have a copy, please tell them about it and place an order. Uh, before we begin, let's pray for, uh, you know, um, for this wonderful guest uh, with us right now, uh, Rita. And it will just be a short prayer. Lord, I thank you for uh, having uh, Miss Rita on my show. And I pray that uh, as she shares about her life and her book that she has uh, released uh, you know, into the market, I pray that uh, the viewers will be blessed and the viewers will, will find uh, you know, uh, hope and also uh, trust you know, in, in what she has to, to offer. And I pray that, uh, you know, that this book will be a blessing to many. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, Ms. Uh, Rita, thank you for joining us here at the National Quiz Choice. Tell us more about, about your life uh, you know, as a composer, artist, and even right now as an author uh, on Finding Eve. Uh, that's the name of the, 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 this wonderful book. You know? And uh, what inspired you to, you know, to actually lead this movement? Well, I've spent the last 20 years of my life writing, as you say, and composing music, really music um, predominantly for the church. So where um, years ago we would have um, relied on hymnals or things like that, we sing more contemporary worship songs. And so I write those contemporary worship songs and ha have been doing that for a while. In fact, I got my start years ago in a movement called the Vineyard. Um, uh, Vineyard was a pretty large church planting movement, and they um, were very popular with uh, worship music and um, Christian music. And so that's kind of where my beginning happened. And so as a composer, um, I'm also one that has spent a lot of time in conferences and in the church and outside the church and the marketplace and all kind of different areas and noticing um, just... Uh, uh, how women operate and how they don't operate and, and what women believe and what they don't believe and how the church encourages um, and how they don't encourage and um, what the world has to offer um, women and what, they, what the world doesn't have to offer women. And so I've just kind of been almost a spectator in a lot of ways um, in the vein of what um, caused me to become an author to this book. Um, it was just years of um, watching women hurt and not know um, how to fully lay down their hurt, watching women not know how to succeed, just even in belief over their, their own hearts, um, their own families, their own children. And so that really, the years of of being kind of involved in the church and writing music and seeing um, the health that um, worship offers the soul. I think that anything with regard to creative arts, um, painting, dancing, singing, I think that's a, a movement in our soul regardless of what we believe. Music captivates us. The arts captivate us. And so um, I love that, but I also have lived my life captivated by a God, captivated by a maker. And um, so what I did is I used, I used the arts and the creative ability that I had to um, um, be inspired by my captivity of my belief in God and, and how he could change me, how he could um, redo my life, how he could give me hope. And in that, it created this need to encourage other people in freedom um, via the creative arts, because I think that um, the creative arts is a major source of um, healing for people in and outside the church. I don't really, it doesn't really matter if you're saved or you're unsaved. Um, we're drawn to the creative arts for a certain purpose. And so I think because I'm a woman, 
um, I always wanted to find out what is the best way that I could could um, facilitate encouraging other women to believe in themselves. And you can do that so much with music, but I think writing about certain things and, and um, logging my thoughts and my conversations with God um, became what kind of Finding Eve started to um, morph kind of into. And that's kind of where I got my start. So I got my start in music because I loved the creative arts and um, started writing music for the church and then evolved into this place of there's more here. I've got to write about this. I see a need here. I need to write about this. And I think that's what's created a platform um, to really um, make my voice one that can be used to just empower women to believe in themselves, really not empower them to, you know, be something that they're not, but empower them to really believe that God made them for a certain purpose and really to go after what is that purpose and to ask themselves the question, what am I worth? What am I worth? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really what's propelled me into this season of my life with, um, with the book that I just finished called Finding Eve. Now, could you share with us uh, how could women find their self-worth you know, as, you, as you had? Um, and is it is self work plays an important part of life today? Well, I I think it's I think it's one of them. It's the center point um, of everybody's soul. If you do not walk with any kind of confidence, male or female, if you do not believe that you have something to offer, or that you have. Um, um, something that you were created for, then, then really it's the difference. I say this a lot. There's a difference um, in surviving and living. And you can survive as long as you need to. But when you begin to live, you begin to really, really experience life to the fullest. And a lot of us, especially as women, again, I can only speak to the gender that I am and understand it fully because I walk in that vein. But I do believe that 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 concept of surviving and living really found on on self-worth for both male and female. And if you have a low self-esteem, you are only surviving in your life. If you have gone after healing, internal healing, um, external healing from traumas, from experiences that you've had that have been really difficult, divorces, broken relationships, everything that that happens in life. Um, If we choose freedom as opposed to staying in our bondage, um, we're, we're actually learning how to live. But if we continue to stay in our bondage, we're only really surviving through life. And I think that's, um, that's why um, understanding that you were made for a purpose, r- really regardless of your belief system. Of course, um, I've taken on the belief system my whole life that I was made for a purpose, that somewhere um, I was thought about by God and uh, scriptures say that he knew me before I was ever even conceived. And so because I was so on his mind, I must have had a purpose. And I want to live my life in search of that great purpose to not only honor the Lord, but also understand I wasn't here just to survive. I'm here to live and live abundantly in freedom and you know, um, progressive nature and understanding that God has more and more and more and more and more for me to obtain. And I think it's why I, I feel like this is such a valid issue, um, for people. It really, again, it, it, it's wonderful if we understand the, the deity of God, because it just brightens up the whole picture but many people don't live in that. They live in, in, in a dark reality that, that there is no hope. And so when you, when you live with the dark reality that there is no hope, then measure your self-worth up against that. And it's pretty bleak. But hope 
when it's thrown on somebody or courage when it's thrown on somebody kind of lights the path and begins to incorporate a sense of there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. And I think that's why I've had such a passion to see people free um, from what binds them and bounds them to a place where they can't function and they have no self-worth. Because I think it's key to life, mm -hmm. not key to survival, but key to life. So I don't know if that makes sense. but <laughs> well, well, speaking about keys to life, you know, uh, we have a, a question right now that's coming in, and I think uh, a lot of women are eager to know. And that is, um, there's this question right now that's coming in, and that's coming in from Malaysia. Uh, dear Rita, uh, can you tell us uh, how has th this book, Finding Eve, uh, been uh, a great reflection for you? Could you share with us more? Uh, when, when you wrote this book, uh, were there uh, some uh, examples that you can share with us how this book has has actually given you a bigger perspective absolutely um, I'm a very firm believer that if I'm going to do something whether it's writing a song or writing a book or writing a poem or that what whatever I'm writing about I first experience so that I'm not giving away a, um, a mental picture of something that I'm not willing to walk out. And so really, the whole concept of the book started with a longing and a yearning in my own heart to really fully embrace everything I was made for. And so I had these long conversations with the Lord and I would sit down and I would just really meditate and pray and say, you know, talk to me about my value. Talk to me about my worth, because the world says that this is what worth looks like. But you say this is what worth looks like. So t show me what who is true. Show me what it is. And I felt like he kept drawing me back to tracing the lineage as best I could of the first woman that was ever spoken about in scripture. And so that made me go all the way back to Genesis, to the beginning. And all of the teachings that I've ever heard about her were pretty negative. Everything was, you know, she's mentioned four times in scripture and everything was about her sin and her inability um, to uh, to not sin, or her her uh, her weakness to be to succumb to the enemy's taunts, and I felt like the Lord re began to reroute that and showed me her strengths, and showed me that He never creates anything that He doesn't have destiny over, and so I had to find myself in that first model, and that's why I began to research the way that I did and. Um, and, and grab a hold of not just her life, but then see how my life mirrored that. She had pain. I have pain. But she had a God that she talked to. I have a God that I talked to. I mean, I think about her and I think about how, you know, she was the first woman to experience relationship, the first woman to experience pregnancy, the first woman to experience childbirth pain, the first woman to experience all of those things that we don't really even give her credit for. And she didn't have any roadmap. She had to experience it all um, completely without any interpretation except for God drawing her through it. And so I started there and realized that she was probably a woman that lost her hope a lot. And then I, I could think about all the areas in my life where I didn't have hope. I lost my hope. And how would I gain back my hope by trusting in God? Maybe in different circumstances or different ways, but really I was no different than her. She was no different than me. And if God loved her enough to fashion her, you know, scripture says that he forms man, but he fashions women. And so he took a completely different approach in even the way he made both male and female. And for me, that meant something. It meant researching and finding out the mystery to why God um, had this idea of a woman all along. She was always in his mind, always in his mind to create. And so 
there are interesting things in my life that, you know, I've been through. I've been through years of singleness and wondering, you know, when the Lord was going to answer my prayers. I've um, faced sickness and illness and not known how to get through it. I um, went through uh, the adoption of my son and did it without being married and then raising a child as a single woman. I mean, who does that, you know, and, and walks into that wanting to do that and wanting for that cost uh, to to be something you walked out. Mm-hmm. You know, my parents have both died of cancer. And so loss has been something I've understood and I've known. So I could take all of these aspects of life and turn around and, and see that the life that she led, even in those um, four mentions of scripture, there was a pretty impactful sections in, in, that, in that portion of Genesis where you realize she had to learn how to live. She could not survive. She had to learn how to live. And she was attacked from the first moment. She was attacked. And I have felt attacked for my belief. I have felt attacked for my love for the Lord. I have felt like I'm always under some kind of spiritual attack because um, the enemy's not okay with me being in love with the Lord. He's not okay with me um, proclaiming the good news of God. So there's a lot of likenesses and a lot of... um, a lot of stories I even have in the book um, where I've had to learn how to reach for hope and trust and find obedience and um, understand influence, all of those different kinds of things. And speaking of, of influence and your experience, there's another question coming in from Indonesia, and that is, uh, dear Rita, uh, could you tell us more about worship? What is worship? How has worship uh, redefine you as a woman. Is worship good for, for us? And is there any evidence that when we worship God uh, in you know, with our voice and music, it has actually uh, transcend our soul? I think so. I um, I think that the one word that I would use to describe what worship is is relationship. Um, you bow down to what you love. So if you spend all your time in front of the television set or at the movies or with your friends or and you consume your life with a certain um, thing, um, that is another form of worship. That, that we, we were all born to bow down to something. We were all born to... Um, to follow a vision, to follow a destiny. And I think that worship in its truest form is relationship with God. And in truly relating with God, understanding the love of the Lord or coming into a revelation of the love of the Lord. For me, that's what it was. I had this revelation. Oh my gosh, he loves me. Uh, I'm loved. God loves me. I had this amazing revelation and it made me want to sing. It made me want to um, just abandon myself to whatever I was asked of because relationship with him became everything and it transcended every part of my outer and my inner because my outer would begin to lift its hands and I began to act differently and um, I loved people differently and my heart began to embrace community differently and I realized I don't want to I don't want to not deal with unforgiveness I want to forgive that relationship with God made me um, almost permeate worship from my being And um, so I do believe that the only reason that it's a foreign concept to us, this whole thing of worship, is because we haven't had an experience with God. And in order to truly understand worship, you truly have to have a relationship with God because true relationship and true revelation with God completely overwhelms every part of your life. And you'll never know it unless you ask for it. It's why it's almost hard to explain because everybody has their own experience. But 
it's so simple to find. And I think that's why salvation is so awesome that all we really have to do is call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And then instead of being religious, just create relationship with him. If, if you meet somebody and you shake their hand and all of a sudden they become a business partner or you work with them every day, you're creating relationship with them and you're inviting them into your heart and inviting them into your life. And it's the same thing with the Lord, except that he's so supernatural that nothing is the same after you make contact with God. And I think that really is the essence to what worship's all about. The only reason I sing the only reason I've ever written any music is because I met him and that relationship completely transformed every other aspect of my lore, of, of my life. And I couldn't keep it quiet. I had to sing about it. And that's why I began to compose music. There's another question right now is coming in all the way from Cambodia. And that is, uh, dear Rita, tell us more about uh, change. How, how can I uh, cope with change? Because change is so hard, uh, even for both uh, men and women, especially women, uh, we have to cope with a lot of changes in life. Uh, is change good for me? I think it is. I think that um, I always tell my students that I think that worship and relationship with God is what I call a progressive state. Um, it's kind of like the word salvation. The word salvation is not a past tense. It is an ever-present tense. So um, I think the, the Greek format to it is um, sozo. It, and so when we say something like, I was saved when I was five, um, what we're really saying is I started salvationing when I was five. So even today, I am still in movement of my salvation, which means that my salvation is changing all the time. Um, so I think change is great because I think that we're progressive beings and tomorrow is not um, today. And so um, tomorrow may hold all these other different circumstances and situations. And I think it's important to understand that we have to separate the natural world from the spiritual world. We, I believe in a spiritual world, and I believe that my, my soul is operating in belief of that. But I have to live in my flesh in this world. And so I want to change tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day because I don't want to I don't want to be stuck in the flesh. I don't want to be stuck in unforgiveness. I don't want to be stuck in in um, how life can kind of bring you down and how all the things that come around you and circumstances can be so burdensome in our lives. And I think it is great to always look for the perspective of change. And how, how do we change? We, we ask God to change us. Because if God is doing the changing... And he's the one that's initiating the change. And all we're doing is saying, okay, 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 okay. And we're doing the releasing. That's when I think change is the most beautiful. When God's doing the, the, doing the work and we're doing the release, where we're just saying, we release it, Lord, we release it. So I think that we all need to be in a progressive state of wanting to become better and better and freer and freer and, and um, you know, less and less while God becomes more and more. So I think it's why change is so important. Another question from Vietnam, and that is, uh, dear Rita, how do you uh, overcome, uh, overcome uh, is feelings of insecurity? Could you give us some practical steps? Uh, that you have experienced as yeah. uh, we've got. I think, I, I talk again to my students a lot about the spirit of insecurity because any time that you're in public and any time that you feel like you have a call and a dream, um, first thing the enemy is going to do is just come in with a bunch of insecurity. And I really believe that um, what I have felt from um, the Lord is that insecurity was actually can work as a gift to us. Insecurity, when it's recognized um, for being an attack or um, when you realize, oh, my gosh, I, I, I don't think I could do this. I don't think I could do this. I, um, it, it makes me turn toward the Lord and humble myself and say, 
I, this is way out of my league. I don't know how to do this, God, but I'm just going to humble myself. And my insecurity then becomes my humility. But insecurity, when it feeds off of self-control, um, unforgiveness, anger, the roots are resentment and all those things, it makes us feel like we have to do anything we can not to be insecure or live in this facade. And so what I always say to people that struggle with insecurity is turn toward God and ask for the spirit of humility. Because usually the spirit of humility causes us to bow and bend and humility covers and overshadows all the insecurity that, um, that kind of um, can attack us and attach itself onto us. Because a lot of what the enemy is after is our insecurity to become our pride. And I think we really have to um, have our eyes open because a lot of the insecurity or the root of insecurity in people that are angry, um, you see uh, marriages that are relationships that constantly falter because we're always looking for somebody else to medicate us or somebody else to, um, uh, to, to be what it is we don't have. And a lot of that is just a route to, to insecurity. And somehow that route has gone out of control and becomes our biggest area of control issues when really... We just need humility. And so I think that would be the first thing I would say to somebody that's struggling with um, not being noticed, rejection, um, not feeling accepted, all of those things in the workplace, in the home, if they've grown up in abusive households, there's insecurity to even trust anybody. So insecurity is attached to all of our trust issues. And I think it's just bowing before the Lord and saying, God, I, I need your humility because if your humility washes over me, then your humility will turn my insecurity into sheer humility before the Lord. And, um, and God can bring strength when there's weakness and insecurity is a weakness. And we need to start praying for the strength of the Lord to overcome our weaknesses. Rita, could you tell us more about uh, you know, your program, Finding Eve? Uh, I know that you have been doing this for a long time, and how can uh, my viewers, you know, also uh, able to benefit uh, from this program that you have organized? Well, there are two different things that I've done. I I, I have um, led a kind of a two or three day women's conference called Finding Eve, and that's just at um, different um, host churches um, across the U.S. And those three days are really just to throw courage on the hearts of women to believe in themselves again. But what I also do is I do a program called DIVE, and it's an acronym for Deep Innovative Vertical Expression. And it's a creative arts or worship school, and it's a week long, and that's a week intensive where we bring our students through a sense of freedom foundations and understanding how to create um, by uh, through our freedom instead of through our bondage. A lot of times our creative arts are, um, are known because of our angst or our pain or our woundedness. And I think that we are beings that if we got free, what would the Lord bring out of us in our art if we were free? And so those are a couple programs that I have. I mean, I think um, writing the book and releasing the book, I would recommend that, that especially women who are really struggling with identity issues and with um, feeling just afraid of, uh, of any kind of encouragement at all, and um, women who feel completely rejected and um, lost should read the book and um, either read it online or download it on iTunes, on their laptops, and, and really go after um, just being able to start speaking life over their own souls instead of living in a, in a status of unbelief. And I think that's really um, my, my biggest encouragement is that we need to believe more. We need to believe more that there are, poss there are possibilities out there that can heal us and that the Lord is that possibility. So those are encouragements that I would have. If, if people are creative-minded and they want to come to the worship school, they can always find that at diveworship.com, which is D-I-V-E, 
worship.com. Um, or they can look online for uh, our Finding Eve conferences at this point. But my first recommendation would be to just get a hold of the book and read the book to find some uh, some encouragement that way. And yes, and encouragement it is, folks. Uh, my viewers, please uh, do look up for, for her book, Finding Eve by Rita Springer, available at all Good Lane bookstores, Amazon.com, Barnes & Nobles, and also at your nearest bookstore. If not, please tell them to place an order for you. But before we go, um, Ms. Rita Springer, could you tell us what will be the one key takeaway uh, you know, from, from your experience after you've written this book? What was the one thing that you've learned? I think the, the, um, the thing that I hold closest to my heart is that um, I lived for a long time not believing I, I was made with a purpose. And I know without a shadow of a doubt now that I was made with a very specific pur purpose in mind and that I have something to offer. It doesn't matter how um, successful my life would ever be. That's not the point. The point is I, I know that I was made for something great because I was made by somebody who's the greatest. And that's my biggest um, or probably the most um, uh, revelatory thing that I've learned is that I was made with a purpose and made by greatness. And um, I can do anything as long as God is there to strengthen me. And how do women able to find that purpose? Is it is it through the experience or is it through the revelation from God? I think it is. I think it's 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 humbling yourself to um, step out of your pain, even if it's for a brief moment, and risk everything to believe maybe possibly God has my number. Maybe this whole God thing is real. Maybe God really does love me. Even if it takes everything they have to step out of that uh, life of darkness for one brief moment just to risk believing that they were made with a purpose and, and crying out to the Lord to show them that purpose. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. And so it is. And folks, please do uh, get hold of this book by Rita Springer, Finding Eve, now available at all Google bookstores, uh, Amazon.com, Barnes & Nobles, and also at your nearest bookstore. And this episode has been proudly sponsored by Charisma Media. I'm Robin Steinberg. Thank you for joining me here at The National Creator's Choice. Have a good week ahead. Oh. What's, what's next for you? Are you, are you, are you writing a, a new book? Uh, well, we just released that, and I think if I if I started on a new book, I would probably write on adoption, um, and the spirit of adoption. Um, but I'm really, really um, taking this school of mine, this creative school of mine, into a whole new level in the next couple years. So that's taken a lot of my time, a lot of my time. Uh, so, you, and I'm you... still writing and stuff like that, writing music and stuff. So you'll be releasing uh, more new albums, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, uh, I will. Okay. Well, once again, uh, thank you for for joining. You're very me. welcome. Yeah, you're very welcome.